Uh, thank you everybody for being with us and this, this first seminar on a series of seminars on mathematical modeling of COVID-19. This is uh, sponsored by a project of UNAM, the PAPIT, uh, PAPIT grant that uh, we got in an effort of the National University for to help in the control and mitigation of the epidemic that we have all over the world, in particular in Mexico. There were 12 projects uh, approved. One of them, the one in mathematical modeling is this one. And uh, it's a joint collaboration between the Facultad de Ciencias with Dr. David Sanders, Institute of Physics with Dr. Isaac Perez, and Institute of Mathematics of Marcel Jorge Velasco. Then this is the introduction. This is the reason we're here. The other one is about the talk. The talks are uh, organized in 15 minute talks, uh, followed by a series of questions and answers. These questions and answers will be, the questions will be uh, written in the chat that is available to you. And so either of us, which is uh, Isaac, David, or me, can uh, co uh, relay the question to our speaker tonight. And, uh, or you can raise your hand. I, there is a little icon there that you can also use in order to uh, the question. Uh, other thing is that uh, the opinions that are given by the speakers uh, are those of themselves. This is no, the UNAM position is, is uh, independent on that. This is important because as you know, COVID is a political issue too. And we want a meeting in which we have respect, openness, questions, technical questions are the openness that scientific endeavors require, but we ask respect and uh, to concentrate on the specific aspects of the talk so we can get a nice uh, uh, interaction with our speaker. Of course, uh, we uh, abide to the, uh, uh, the lines or the concepts or the principles of respect of, uh, of ideas, openness, no discrimination, will be no, uh, th that's a policy. And the other one is an important one. Silang was a co-author recently of a letter for in science talking about the transparency the uh, promotion of free exchange of ideas, uh, core sharing, purity, for all things that have to do with modeling of COVID, because that's the only way we, want to, we can get together ideas and models and tools in order to fight this disease. Uh, this is the, the general terms, and now I go to present our speaker, is Dr. Filan Silan Feng. She's an extraordinary researcher. She's a professor at uh, the Mathematics Department of Purdue University. Uh, she's also recently a uh, program director of the program in Mathematical Biology, National Science Foundation, I think from last year, beginning last year. She has uh, been very active in this. I read in SIAM that they have sponsored several uh, grants specifically for modeling uh, COVID-19. And it's a pleasure to have, have her here. She has uh, above more than 100 journal articles three books, one of them on plant herbivore systems, I think, and most of them in mathematical epidemiology, one of them a very important uh, monograph on the applications of mathematical models to public health, which is a very relevant in these days. She's an expert in many uh, infectious diseases, particularly influenza, influenza-like uh, infections. So to the, tonight, Silang uh, honors us by giving the first talk, and the title of the talk is Stagger Release Policies for COVID-19 Control, Costs and Benefits of Relaxing Restrictions by Age and Risk. So, Silang, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge, for the nice introduction. And thank you, uh, thanks to uh, organizers for inviting me to give this talk. And this is a joint work with Henry Zhao from Princeton University. And we all know that strong social distancing restrictions, including lockdown, have worked for containing the spread of COVID-19 pandemic, but uh, now has, has been uh, impo in, an important question is to uh, identify a safe strategy to uh, go back to uh, normal or at least subnormal uh, social interactions and restart the economy without jeopardizing public health. And this work focuses on identifying a strategy that can allow certain people, a certain groups of people to return to social interactions first before the general population is released. 
and we call this stagger release. Uh, so we'll present uh, examples that can show that this sequential release or stagger release by groups and the risk can do better than the simultaneous release of the general population in the sense that they can protect more uh, vulnerable people and increasing economic activities. This figure is sort of uh, an illustration of what can happen if you put strong re restrictions first, for example, from time T0. So from this time, uh, you start uh, intervention, control policy. And then the, the epidemic curve will change from this dotted curve, which is the epidemic without any intervention policies, to this thick curve that you know, reduced not only the peak time, but also the number of infections. But then after a period of time of the strong, say, social distancing policy, and you want to re relax this strict policy at a time T end. And if you just release everyone at the uh, same time, uh, even though you may still have some kind of uh, uh, social distancing policy in place, uh, for example, here I said the S B, so that's for kind of severity in terms of the strength of social distancing restrictions. So B for beginning. So at this point, you have SB restriction, but at T end, you release that uh, the, the uh, policy to, to have a new level, say SR, R for residual period, and say the, the level the number between zero and one representing the strength or severity of restrictions. Okay, the, the, uh, the value equal to one represent the, uh, the normal, the business as usual. And then uh, if this value is, uh, sorry, one, yeah, run, um, the higher value represent stronger really, uh, restriction and the smaller value represent more relaxed. And uh, so we can see that what happens that you will likely to see a second wave with the, uh, the peak that might be high enough to exceed this healthcare capacity, which is, uh, could be very bad. So the question is, can we figure out a, a strategy that will uh, allow people to return to, uh, uh, to the work or school uh, as early as possible, but safely. So that's the the goal of this study. And I forgot to mention that this is actually a published work. It's published in Mathematical Biosciences, published in June, June 13. If you're interested, I can send you the PDF. And how do we identify such a policy? The This figure shows the current uh, uh, situation for COVID-19 in the United States. It's a number of new cases up to uh, July 29th of this year. And we can see that total cases have passed 5 million and total deaths is up, uh, above 160,000. And this is for the whole United States. And in some states, the situations are uh, more uh, severe. For example, in Texas or Florida or Arizona, and in Texas, in the early July, it said that the ICU capacity was exceeding 100%. So that could be uh, very dangerous. And in Florida and Arizona, uh, also in July, there are daily new cases exceed 10,000. Okay, that was higher even than the, the record uh, previously held by New York. And if we look at the specific states, so this figure is from Johns Hopkins University, the website about COVID-19. You can see all states in the United States, the curve, the incidence curve. And some states have pretty low uh, incidence. Some states uh, have uh, much higher. For example, New York City, 
and the high peak occurred actually earlier in April, but for Florida, Texas, or California, or Arizona, you can see the recent rise in the cases. If we zoom in those states, the California, July 29th, the highest daily cases was more than uh, 11,000. Okay, similar for Florida, more than 11,000. And then uh, Texas. Uh, so New York, they had highest peak in April. So it shows that it's still important to uh, change this sort of, you know, the, the, the way of going back to business, right? This is probably a lot of people, they have a higher risk, for example, people with the underlying uh, medical conditions or elderly you know, people above 65 and so on. So if they are infected, they can, they, they may have to go to the hospital or ICU and, uh, and then, uh, you know, could to die from the infection. So if we look at this age dependent, uh, either hospitalization rate or uh, disease death, we can see clearly there's a much higher hospitalization rate for older people in you know, 65 or, or uh, older, there's a record. But you look at the younger one, the yellow and the black between zero and four of 517, they are much lower in terms of hospitalization rate. So they may still get infected, young people, it just they don't get the, uh, the severe infections uh, of more, uh, uh, you know, using hospital or even die from disease. And from the, uh, this figure, we can see the disease mortality, right? also age dependent. This for older people, okay, the red, yellow, and the blue, uh, 65 or older, and versus the younger people, 0 to 24, 25 to 34, there's a light blue or the blue, they are much lower. So some, so this suggests that maybe we can uh, take advantage of this age uh, dependent uh, disease mortality or hospitalization rate to identify a releasing strategy. Okay. And for this paper, we consider this New York City, the population in New York City, because they have more detailed age dependent parameters. Uh, for example, this figure, this is from their website, New York City, COVID-19 data. This is access June 9th, 9th. That's when the our paper was uh, submitted. And you can see that the cases, hospitalization, and the deaths okay, for older people, 65 or older, they have much higher hospitalization rate and disease death rate than the younger people, okay, 0 to 17 or 18 to 44. And you can see the case fatality ratio for elderly could be uh, even as high as 40 times uh, uh, higher than the, than the younger group. So we want to take advantage of this uh, difference in the disease mortality and the hospitalization to construct a model. This is California. Similarly, you can see the age dependent death rate. So our model is this uh, SEIR type, but including other factors relevant to COVID-19. For example, this asymptomatic class, okay, those are the people who are infected, but they do not show symptoms. But for COVID-19, those people can still transmit the disease and even at pretty high uh, uh, transmission rate. Uh, so susceptible, exposed, symptomatic, asymptomatic, and the hospitalization is H. And from the hospitalized people, uh, for this class, they can die from the infection or they can recover. It's similar for uh, the symptomatic people or asymptomatic, they can all recover. But uh, uh, asymptomatic people will assume that uh, the death rate can be uh, neglected. And this model, this corresponding ODE system, corresponding to this diagram, uh, we have a three age groups okay, based on the, the, the age dependent, this data structure. Okay, 0 to 17, 18 to 44, and then uh, the middle age and the older group. The reason we combine the first two groups is that uh, if you let the people, say young adults, go back to work, but the young kids cannot stay home alone. So if, if the, those adults go back to work and those students also uh, should go back to school. So we combine those two groups together, young, called the young group, 0 to 44, 
And not all those young people, but only people with low risk. If some young children with a underlying medical conditions, they are considered high risk and they'll be grouped together with the more vulnerable uh, older people. Similarly for middle aged people, uh, for only low risk, they call the group two, and the higher uh, risk people will be grouped with this elderly. And this, uh, the, the uh, M class, that's for dead people, people died from the disease. Okay, this is an important class because we're going to use this to compare policy, compare the staggered release policy with this simultaneous release policy and to see whether or not this staggered release can reduce the disease deaths more. And in the fourth infection, lambda, that's the, the term that linked the three groups. Uh, in this fourth infection, so all three infected group, uh, classes, uh, uh, symptomatically infected and asymptom asymptomatically infected and hospitalized people, they can all transmit the infection, but maybe at a different rate. For example, theta J for the asymptomatic people is going to be less than one okay, with a certain uh, proportion, similar for chi. And the CIJ here is the mixing. It is a, the, described the, the context between different age groups. And A here, we call it effective contact rate. It's a different from the normal contact rate. Because normally uh, we have contact rate multiplied by the probability of infection per contact. Okay? But that, that would in, in include another parameter. So we, to avoid the estimation of more parameters, which is lumped together, called the effective contact rate. Okay. So that's contact that can lead to infection. Okay. But later on, I'll just re refer this to as a contact rate for, for easy uh, reference. And this mixing, okay, we're going to use this so-called preferential mixing. Okay. And the epsilon is the preferential level. That means that for a group I people, if they have a certain number of contacts per unit time, a certain proportion of those contacts will be with other people in the same group. Like for example, for, for uh, children, young people, they probably spend most time with the other uh, people in, at school okay, than uh, with the maybe older groups. And the, the, the specific parameters in here and, and the, the remaining contacts will be distributed among all groups according to this sort of a proportional uh, uh, proportionally distributed. Okay? And this kind of mixing, okay, we have published several papers on this, uh, all kinds of mixing, including preferential mixing. Okay? So this graph shows uh, the sort of data in the Mosson, uh, published in, in, a, in a, a sort of survey data, how certain group, uh, age group people will distribute their contacts. For example, the main diagonal represent contact for people with other in the same group. So the lighter color represent that the more contacts will be with uh, other people in the same group. And we can fit this function, this preferential function into this data and to estimate this preferential level, epsilon, for example, and, and other parameters. And uh, this data also gave us this baseline, uh, the contact number A. And then you can see that the observed, this data versus the model, they have pretty good match. And we have applied those mixing function in different uh, modeling studies, including uh, influenza, potassium, uh, measles, and so on. Okay. Uh, so at least a couple of references here. So we, we can just choose those values, uh, for example, absolute in this study, so we don't have to do other detailed uh, fitting. And then the important parameter will be this effective contact rate because the social distancing policy, if you have a restrictions, that means that the contact rate will be reduced. Okay. Stronger re, uh, restrictions, sorry, correspond to lower the contact rate. So the contact rate A will be dependent on time and this a zero I is the background, that's a baseline contact. That's the that you don't do anything. Don't do any social distancing. Or, uh, that's the contact number. And that is related to the basic reproduction number 
by this formula, assuming that we know all other parameters. For example, gamma is for in recovery rate, and uh, uh, P is proportion of asymptomatic infection. Uh, theta is the reduction of transmission by asymptomatic infected people. So we know if we know all those parameters, and then if we have estimates of R0, then we will get this A. And then once we have a background A0, we can define this the effective reflection number according to given uh, social distancing policy, uh, defined this way. Uh, here, SB again represent the severity of restrictions. S equal to one, corresponding to no contact, the most strict ones. And uh, S equal to zero means business as usual, it is no restrictions. And we have a different time period, for example, so this T0 is the, the beginning time when this the restriction start is, uh, starts, okay? and we call the initial period. And then at time T1, you will change policy. You can change this restriction level. For example, you want to relax it, you let people go back to uh, business, and then uh, the timing will also be part of the policy. And then maybe at a T2, you will change the policy again. For example, the first period, you let only group one, the young people, out. Uh, uh, so, sorry, I apologize. This SB, this all three groups follow the strict policy. Okay. And then at T1, you let young people. Okay. The subscript represent the period, and the superscript represent the group. So you let group one out because they have a lower severity. Okay. Until T2, you let the group two also back to social. Uh, um, interactions. And then at the T end, all the groups will be released. Okay, that's the residual period with the surveillance level as four. Okay. Uh, so we're going to consider different policies determined by the severity parameter S and the time where policy will be changed. But before we consider this situation, we're going to look at a simpler case where only group one will be released earlier. Okay. So the top figure represents this simultaneous release. Okay. That's the benchmark release, meaning that all groups will be kept at the severity level SB for the initial period time until T end, all groups will be uh, uh, let out at the severity level SR. Okay. This is a benchmark release policy. So we're going to consider the difference between the staggered release policy with this benchmark release policy and to see how this disease death will be uh, affected and how the epidemic uh, curve, the peak of the, the, of the epidemic curve will be affected. And the bottom curve, the B, represent uh, one scenario of staggered release. Okay. So from T0 to T1, initial period, all three groups will follow this as B level of restriction and from T1, we release the, the uh, policy restriction for group one at the, this some level between SR and SB. Okay. And after T end, all three groups will be released at the level SR. Okay. Um, so for presentation purposes, I'll assume in this talk, SB is point A, so the initial the strict social distance policy corresponding to SB equal to 0.8, sorry. And at, after the residual period, the restriction level SR will be 0.2. So basically, after you release everyone, you still want to keep certain level of social distancing, okay, not just uh, go back to business as usual. Okay, the results. So in this figure, we show four different time variable, T. So T is the time when you start releasing the younger group, okay, T1. Okay, we have T1 with 20, 30, 40, and 50, okay, representing four policies. And for the restriction level, S21, we consider five different levels, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and the 0.8 represent the benchmark. Okay, so you see the dark black, black curve representing the benchmark scenario. Okay, you just let everyone out at the T end, 
that will be this epidemic curve okay, with that kind of level of peak size. But if you look at the S21 equal to 0.4, so restriction level for group one is 0.4, and the red curve will, uh, is the epidemic curve. So basically, you have higher infections okay, in comparison with the black curve, the benchmark case. But after T end, okay, so at this point, all groups will have 0.2 level of restriction, and the continue uh, this epidemic curve okay, will you know, look at this red one. Okay. So overall, this red curve will have a much lower peak size. And then in the next slide, we'll see that the total number of deaths will also be reduced by a lot in comparison with the benchmark uh, policy. So, so the, uh, this is kind of non-intuitive in the sense that you, know, you let people out first in comparison with the benchmark, how would it be how would it be possible that you reduce the number of deaths and peak size? Right. So I put in here uh, just sort of a kind of uh, heuristic argument. Okay. Suppose that after residual period we have activity level AR for all group, and the gamma is the infection uh, uh, recover rate. So AR over gamma gives you the control reproduction number. Okay, control means you have still have social distancing, the control reproduction number. But with a different severity, the superscript S, the number of recovered people at the T end, number of recovered people at the end, this proportion is the population level of immunity. Okay, so one minus that proportion will represent the proportion of population still susceptible. Okay, so the actual effective reproduction number corresponding to the severity level S is the control reproduction number here multiplied by this factor. Okay, that's less than one. Okay, so if you look at this red curve, because more people are infected before T end, okay, so your population immunity is higher. So remaining proportion of susceptible will be lower. And that's why the effective reproduction number for the red curve after this point will be much lower. Okay, so that lead to much uh, lower uh, infection rate. Okay. And the reason for the lower more, uh, num number of deaths is because those infections are all low risk young people. Okay. So they have very much lower disease mortality and hospitalization rate. Okay, and that uh, advantage of this uh, re uh, releasing young, low-risk people first. Okay. If we look at this disease deaths, okay, we use this quantity, okay, the total number of deaths under the benchmark policy, DBI, for group I, minus the total number of deaths for group I under the sorry, under the staggered release policy, okay, the difference divided by the benchmark disease, so we call it efficacy. Okay. So that represents the, 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 the level of reduction in disease deaths. Okay. The higher this FI, the better the policy will be. So the total number of deaths, you integrate the number of deaths from hospitalized people plus number of uh, deaths from the symptomatic class, okay, integrate from T0, to infinity, so that's give you total or cumulative number of disease deaths. Okay, so, and this figure again shows those policies for T1 between 20 and 50, for the severity level for younger group between 0.4 and 0.7, and that the benchmark, the DB corresponding to S21 equal to 0.8. Okay, and you can see that all this efficacy for the Group three, which is the older group, they are all positive, and also the reduction is highest, corresponding to severity level equal to 0.4. It's the most relaxed policy, and also at the earlier time, T1. And for T F0 is a sum of all F, F1, F2, F3. That's the overall death. The reduction is also positive. Okay, again corresponding to S21.4, you get the highest reduction in disease death. 
So this shows again the benefits of the staggered release okay, of the younger group, younger people with low risk. And if you look at the efficacy for group one and two, you observe similar reduction. Like if you have a lowest reduction, uh, reduction because young young people they already have a very low disease death. Okay. Uh, so so overall, the staggered release policy will lead to lower number of disease deaths and lower number of uh, lower peak size for the epidemic. But the timing and the severity level could be very important. Now, if we uh, talk a little bit about parameters, uh, choice of parameter values. Okay. So this again, this is in New York City, cases, hospitalization, and the deaths. Okay. We know the population structure so for different age groups, a certain percentage, and with that, and we also know the hospitalization rate and the disease death rate. Okay. From those, we can estimate the parameters. Eta, the gamma is from knowledge. Okay, people usually uh, assume that this infection period is anywhere between maybe five days, seven days, seven, uh, seven days, ten days, or even uh, fourteen days. They're all different. But uh, in the we later we uh, look at the sensitivity. Okay, if we choose a different value of the infection period, how that would affect the outcome. Um, so this is for the other parameters and for R zero. The R zero relates this uh, background activity level. For R zero, we have this from literature. Most papers assume R zero to be between two and three, but this study by uh, this, uh, Shen in the uh, published in Emerging Infectious Diseases, they actually estimate this refraction number to be five point seven with a ninety five percent of confidence interval of three point eight to eight point nine. So that's much higher than this uh, uh, most cited uh, range, two and three. So we actually uh, have this, we use the New York, again, the case data. Okay? If we fit this, just one group, okay, you ignore the age dependence, just one group uh, with a percentage of symptomatic 0.7, so assuming 30% asymptomatic, uh, again, this parameter may also ch be changing okay, according to CDC uh, published uh, values. And we assume that the reduction for asymptomatic infection is 0.5 in comparison with the symptomatic people, the infect transmission rate. And then, uh, so estimate the eight and the Q previously, and the latent period, 10 days, the infection period is seven days, and uh, the duration in the hospital set 10 days, so fix all others. And then we fit this model to this case data, we get this R0 to be 3.4, okay, if the relative uh, reasonable fit uh, in terms of the number of cases. This is 100 number of cases uh, in your city. And then we can get the baseline A0. And once we get A0, we can get this AT, which is uh, the uh, effective reduction number corresponding, effective contact rate corresponding to the severity level restriction SB. And the relationship between the group reproduction number R0i and the total reproduction number for the meta population, for the set of population, is determined by this next generation matrix. Okay? And that will relate this baseline contact number. And this T, T is dependent on all those disease related parameters okay? and mixing Cij. This way, and the largest eigenvalue of this matrix is the group whole population reproduction number. So that uh, whole population has this reproduction number R zero as some kind of weighted average of the group reproduction numbers weighted by those mixing parameters. Um, so this three point four for the whole population corresponded to different reproduction numbers for uh, each age groups. So before I continue to talk about other scenarios, uh, here we summarize the results okay, so far. First of all, this stagger release can uh, increase the 
uh, efficacy or reduced the disease death in comparison with this simultaneous release. And the, uh, uh, the level of efficacy increases with a decreased severity level. And that's what we observed so far. And the peak size is the highest for intermediate value. It is the lowest for intermediate value of the severity level. So that shows the importance of identifying the correct re restriction. When you release the younger group, what is the uh, most appropriate level of uh, uh, really, uh, relax relaxation? And also the timing can be important. And uh, so that shows that uh, staggered release policies can protect more vulnerable people and lower the peak size and increase economic activities because it allow, uh, allow a certain group of people to go back to work and school earlier without increasing the public health uh, um, negative, you know, jeopardize the public health. Now, in terms of sensitivity analysis, okay, we show the those results for fixed group of parameters. If we change some of the parameters, and one is this uh, actually more generalized release, uh, standard release. We allow both younger group, group one, uh, the early release first, but at some point T2 will release the middle age group, okay, the second age group with a, this level. And then all groups will be released at the R, SR level. So if we do that, then we can see that uh, the efficacy, again, depends on the level of the severity and the timing, T2. Okay. And the overall result is that releasing the middle age group first, it, earlier than the, uh, the, the older people, can still do better in comparison with this simultaneous release. But the timing and the, and the level of severity can be important. So that's the general finding. And if we increase the reproduction number okay, from 3.4 earlier to 4.6, okay, so we know that reproduction number is some sort of average, right? It can vary between populations. Okay? For example, in New York, New York City, the reproduction number is probably much higher than places like uh, Wyoming. Okay, that the population density can play an important role. Okay, sorry, I'm running out of time. Um, but in any case, so this shows that similar observations in terms of the peak size and the total number of disease deaths reduction, again, the re stagger release can do better than simultaneous release. But again, the timing and the severity level can be important. And this slide shows if we change this uh, younger group, this disease mortality, if it's not as low as uh, like in your city or, or other uh, data show, if, if you increase the younger group mortality, mortality uh, what will happen is the younger group will have a negative efficacy, meaning that their death rate will be increased. So this is some kind of a cost of releasing young people earlier if their mortality rate is, uh, is relatively in higher than what we presented in early examples. So again, we have to be very careful. And the last slide, I think it's the next second to last slide, this shows that if we change the proportion of asymptomatic infections okay, from 0.5, 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and change this infection period using seven, eight, nine, ten days. And we can see that the reduction of the deaths or the efficacy, they are still positive. It's just at a different level. But the general results that stagger release can reduce mortality, can protect the more vulnerable people, at the same time, let people out earlier to increase the economic activities. So those conclusions remain. It's just a level reduction can be different. It is short uh, show some kind of uh, 
robustness of this uh, result. Okay. So in summary, uh, this modeling studies okay, presented some uh, counterintuitive result. In, in, uh, I, I explained earlier, okay, you let release younger people earlier, okay, then the benchmark release policy, but you can still reduce the not only the death rate in the older people, the vulnerable people, but also the overall population uh, deaths. Okay. And the uh, the idea of this staggered release policy can do better is because you let low risk people to uh, go back to work or school, and they can help build up the public immunity. Of course, you know, the best way to increase public immunity is by vaccination, but before the vaccination uh, vaccine are available, and this could be uh, one way to increase public immunity without increasing population death. Okay. Um, and again, this timing and the severity level, uh, the control of the severity level can be very important okay, in order to guarantee that the stagger policy can have a positive benefit. Okay. Um, I think that's all, and I'd like to thank support from NSF. Uh, again, this, the point of view represents my, my, my own viewpoints, doesn't represent NSF, and also collaborate, uh, collaborators, uh, Henry Zhao, Haiyun Zhao, and uh, useful comments and uh, suggestions from Simon Levine and Carlos Chavez. Thank you. Well, thank you, Silan. Very nice talk. Um, I guess we go into uh, uh, questions. I don't know, Silan, you can look at the chat. Yeah, I don't know if it's yeah. Or you can call. Yes, uh, I, I, think, I think there should be two ways. One, one, okay. one, one way is people can write on the chat. Mm -hmm. and as far as I recall, maybe uh, somebody can confirm this. I think in the chat, th there should be an icon saying, uh, raise your hand. I don't see it, but maybe it's because I'm host. But uh, you go to the participants list. In the participant list, so let me see. Oh no, that's not right. Ah, uh, it's not right. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we we go through uh through the chat. Uh, oh yes, no, it is. Yeah, it is. No, it is in the participants list, right? Is right. it? Yes. The, yes, the host can't, can't. The host can't raise the hand. That's why you don't see it. Yeah. Okay. 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 Oh, so sorry. Yes, yeah, so I just. Uh, yeah, sorry. Somebody had their hand up and I lowered it by mistake. Sorry. So please raise your hand again. But uh, yeah, so maybe uh, somebody can just read out the questions that were. Yeah, I can, I can uh, do, do it. it, Isaac, or. or... Yeah, uh, go, uh, go, okay. go ahead. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, you. Yeah. Okay, so let me so let, let me ask the first question. The first question by uh, Bas, by uh, Luis Mochan uh, via the chat. And he was, uh, he asked the following. He, he's curious about the, the factor uh, 0 0.95 that, that multiplies the severity when you say, when you have something like one minus. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, he, yeah, very good question. Yeah. What, uh, what, uh, the, yes. The one behind that number. Yes. Um, yes, I, I, I forgot to explain this. So 0 0.95 just means uh, even though you have a highest restriction, right, no count, it still doesn't mean that you, you absolutely no count, right? You cannot achieve the goal of no count. So that just, uh, the 0.95, just the most you can get, the, the reduction is 95, 0.95. So you, you still expect some level of content. So that's what 9.95 represent there. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, another question by, uh, by Luis Mochan, uh, who says that, uh, can the release timing be chosen when only poor data is available, as for instance in Mexico? Uh, if, so, no, um, no, I don't think this, uh, th this, I mean, data, of course, is helpful. For example, you can identify the point where this uh, public immunity is sufficiently high, right? That will help to protect the older people. That, that's what data can help. But in general, in this uh, study, there was no data uh, used when those different policies are explored. Only in the beginning, when you try to fit some parameter values, we use the data, right? But this, see, we, we just choose this T to be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 in the range, and the relaxation level to be between 0.4 and 0.8.
because the point two is the final, right? The residual stage. Okay, you have to have a restriction level higher than point two. So we choose point uh, four. Actually, you do point three. Sometimes you do you see the higher disease deaths. So that suggests that a point four is the better one, the safe, safe, right? Because you don't want to increase the disease deaths by releasing people earlier. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, but the data would help you to identify sort of safe moment to release. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Uh, and a third question, which is actually a question I have myself by Alejandro Vargas Casillas. Mm -hmm. Uh, given the, the, the model parameters, have you tried uh, to perform an optimization procedure to find the optimal stagger release, uh, release times? Oh, yeah, that'd be interesting. We haven't done that. We have not done that yet. So, so this study, so we just want to get this published soon so just to, to make it uh, known that, you know, there's a potential way of, uh, you know, letting people out first, right, the stagger release. Okay. So basically, we just present several scenarios to demonstrate that stagger release can actually help. Okay. More helpful than, than the simultaneous release. But yeah, optimal, yeah, optimization problem could be very interesting, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have many questions. People are very interested in the, in, in the chat. Another question by, uh, by, by, by Daniel Sagun it says that the, is this model uh, based on the absolute immunity developed by positive cases, or uh, does it take into account recent uh, learnings about partial immunity, which seems to be cases of COVID-19? I think that there is a controversy this, about this. I don't know that maybe when you get infected by, by COVID-19, you, you, you don't get full immunity by partial one. Is this taken into account? Ilan, I think... Uh... I think we lost her. That transmission they, problem, yeah. They don't get a permanent immunity or, or, right, or complete immunity. And the uh, antibody may not be, you know, 100%. So actually, this, is this uh, possible to study maybe allow the R to go back to X? Maybe like a yeah. immunity loss, right? Temporary immunity. Okay, immunity can wane or but they, 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 they will get some level of immunity that may not be, you know, complete. So is, did that answer the question? Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the, there was a bit cut of the video, but I think that the, the, the idea is like if you have partial immunity, don't in the model you can uh, put a, 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 a back to a, S two, two sectivals, and then of course so, a stagger a stagger a stagger release would be less effective. But yeah, yeah, yeah. More, more or you can allow the R people to be so, some level of susceptibility, right? Mm -hmm. yes. e either that or just move some people yeah, back to the. Okay. Yeah. Depending on how complicated you want your model. <laughs> yes, yes, very good. Another question is uh, from uh, Fernando, uh, Fernando uh, uh, Roberto Momo that says, how about the problem of young people living together with old people? How to relax restrictions only for young people? So oh, yeah, that, again, that's a very, very good question. Right. So this obviously, you, you, that factor has been ignored, right? It, it, uh, young people, you very infected, certainly they kind of bring this kind of, uh, you know, the problem to the older people that you live together, right? But uh, if they don't live together, probably young, younger people should uh, be careful, right? And they, they don't, you know, just stay away from the more vulnerable people, right? That's one way. Or you can make the model more complicated, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I've seen people using that, uh, you know, more complicated models to study uh, related to problems, but this, the, 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 the goal of this study is to make a simple model, as simple as possible, and then to demonstrate this point of the stagger release. Yeah, very good. Right. Now, uh, Mariana, I just saw you. I'm going to, uh, uh, I noticed that you raised your hand in the, in the participant list. I'm going to, uh, ah, you are on mute already. Okay, I think you can ask question yourself, Mariana. Go ahead. Yeah, so in fact, it's Sebastian. Uh, sorry. <laughs> we are together. <laughs> yeah, we are together. Sorry. Uh, so I, I have a question just uh, uh, about the fact that uh, the, so, so you, your model is to see what is the uh, optimal way to, to, to go back to business, considering just uh, as a number of uh, dead people. And uh, I would like to know if you can uh, easily uh, 
uh, not modify, but add an information, uh, an economic uh, information about which kind of contribution to the PIB uh, is given uh, each kind of, uh, of uh, group of people considering the age and to convert this information with the model to, to, to offer to the state uh, two kind of models, uh, one which is optimizing the number of deaths and one which is optimizing the number of deaths, but with considering the, the PIB you recover uh, back in, uh, with the back to business of the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also sounds like an interesting problem to study. Uh, again, uh, so you you are thinking about the optimi optimization kind of problem, right? Um, or because I, 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 this this approach is uh, this work is not um, uh, exactly optimization because they, they they did not identify optimal one, right? It's, we're not minimizing the debt, right? They just identify this certain scenario can lead to lower deaths, right? That's different from you minimizing, you find the optimal one, right? That, that's a different kind of problem. Uh, but obviously it will be very interesting if we can, uh, uh, but so, so the, the, the reason I say, if you say, if you don't have a good constraint, you say a minimizing a problem, then of course minimizing, so the, the minimization will be just no, don't, people don't go out. You stay home, complete cut off the contact. Agreed. Your death will be smallest, right? If that's the minimizing uh, solution, then that's not what we are looking for, right? Yeah, totally agree. That's the reason why of my question is because the people, uh, so the countries want to 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 really the people just to have money. In fact, it's just an economic. That's right. Here. Right, right, right. So that's why uh, I was uh, uh, asking if it's possible to have uh, the, the 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 information of the economical impact of each kind of age group, mm -hmm. just to have uh, another kind of scenario taking into account, not just the number of deaths, but- uh, Oh, yeah, you are, th you are thinking about, you are yeah. thinking about like a, like a, like a money-wise, like a how, how much it would cost yeah, yeah. if you got infected, right? Yeah. Or together, or together, because in fact, the politics are just interesting on, on, on the two, in fact, well, more, most of them are just interesting on the economical part of it. But right. if you can find a scenario which is uh, not optimizing, but a scenario which is providing a very good result in kind, in terms right, of right. number of yeah, days, yeah. And a good economic. Uh, right, but then probably that you need to to get more detailed. For example, you, a certain type of job you go by the work. What, what kind of economic values that will cre be created? Right. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Very good. Uh, next question, and I, I'm, I'm trying to see whether I, I, I have all of them, right? I'll, I'll do the, th the last three, right? Which is uh, the following. Uh, Alejandro Gais Corano is asking the following. Uh, the, the cutting edge groups that you have, you have from 0 to 44, 45, 64, and uh, 60 plus, uh, does it work for any country? So I guess uh, that depends on the data in the country, right? Right, yeah, so, so so this, you can split the population any way you want. And so uh, the reason we split this way is because that's what New York City data is in that form, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a different country, different population, your data is presented in, in different cutoff in terms of age groups, right? Some some uh, data, most data probably report like every five year in one group, right? in a demographic sort of uh, structure, uh, zero to one and, and then to five and 10 and 15 and so on, right? And uh, whatever data you have available, I think you can just uh, take advantage of that. Yeah. Right. Because eventually you want to estimate the parameter, for example, hospitalization rate, right? A disease deaths, right? And you, you estimate those values based on this data, right? So it doesn't have to be 44, right? It also depending on, uh, I don't know, some countries, uh, uh, maybe parents are, younger right? so basically you want to have the the, the the flexibility that if you have those parents to go back to work and their children need to have daycare or something right you cannot stay home alone right just this that kind of consideration and then here 65 and older are the opposite have a higher disease death rate that's a good cutoff right for most vulnerable people and i don't know some population was cut off the cutoff for older people is 60 Mm -hmm. I, it just depends. Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess it depends on the data you have for a given country and the right, right. distribution that you have. Okay. 
Uh, Luis uh, Mochan has a, a, another interesting question, which is the following. Mm -hmm. So, so let me uh, translate. So, what about having a, an alternating release? So, for instance, so say that a part of the population works a given period of time, let's say a week, and then it, it rests and is isolated, and then the other part of the population, a certain proportion of the population works while the other part is, is isolated. Is, is this a good and viable strategy? So have you... But, but, but why? Why do you want to rotate? Why do you have to keep the other group home? Just, you know, what, what is the motivation? What is the objective of doing that? Right. Mm -hmm. So right now, we want to increase economic activity. That means that you let people go back to work, eh? Uh, but if you if you keep one group out and then uh, change to another group, wh why? Why do you want to do that? Is it because you you are you are trying to reduce number of infections because fewer people are out? Or the the idea, as I remember when I read about this idea, mm -hmm. is to have the two populations separated from each other, and. Uh, after working for a week, if you get infected, uh, you will stay at home and not work uh, 15 days later when, it, uh, when it's your turn again. So it gives yeah. you time to find out if you have been infected during the week that you worked. So it was proposed some, by some groups, in Israeli groups. Uh, a, yeah, I, I, I guess the, that's probably different the level of complexity, but in any case, if people are infected, they should stay home, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, but then when they are more, um, so they will stay home and not go back to work, right? But they will stay during the uh, period when the infection develops, they would be at home at home anyway. So they won't be infecting anyone else. Yeah, but why do you keep the other group home when they're not infected? Uh, since you don't know if they are infected or not, or not, after some crowd about a week goes by. So that's the reason you keep them home for a week. And then if they're not infected, they go back to work for a week. And then you keep them home again for a week and observe the, so they can be observed. I, I see, I see. You just want to make sure they have enough time to find out whether they are infected. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Both have economic activity at the same time. Yeah, I, I, I guess that'd be interesting, right? That, I, I guess what, what, what would be interesting is to compare if you do that versus without doing that, right? How, yeah. what, what do you save, like, right? <laughs> how, how many either in terms of death saved or, uh, you know, infections, if people don't die from it, don't, don't create a hospital, the hospital like a crisis, like increase the public house capacity, you know, cost uh, um, the overloaded the public health system, then infection is not, uh, I don't know how to say this, right? It's not, uh, um, it's just like a flu, right? You, you, get, <laughs> you get infected if, the, if, if it caused the damage, long-term damage, well, of course, it's not good. But if not, then it's just like a mild people uh, without even knowing it, and then they're just recovered. And that's, that's, um, I don't know, it, it, it just trade off, right? You, you are able to go back to work earlier and, and the, the, with the infection that are not even serious. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, just as it, 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 <laughs> it's hard to, to, uh, um, to compare uh, w w which one, it's just without doing analysis to yeah. see which one is, 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 is better, okay, again, when you say better, you have to define uh, in what sense. Okay, Thank so, you. so uh, Luis, uh, did, did she answer the, the, your questions? Uh, yes, I have to think about it, and I guess we have to <laughs> compare, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is definitely an interesting scenario to study, right? But only if they can do better. Otherwise, you are just coding people <laughs> away from the, the, the economic activity. Yes, yes. So, so I think, so uh, let me do just one more question, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll leave it for today. So Mariana, Mariana Vargas is asking, so this, uh, the following, uh, this age-dependent preferential mixing uh, needs to be uh, calibrated uh, for each country, right? Uh, this one, yes. 
So, so this, this data uh, from Mosson study as a polymod data, they have a European, from European countries. So this give you kind of pattern that you had to apply it to your specific population, right? So we applied it to US population, then you had to, so, you know, usually when you have this contact uh, matrix, you had to balance it. So make sure your group I total number of contacts and the group J total number of contacts must balance. Okay, you had to work uh, before you can use this mixing uh, data. But so that at that step, you can use your specific population. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so very good. So Jorge, shall we leave it for uh, for today? Yes, I think. Thank, thank you very much, Silan, for your very interesting talk. As you see, there is a lot of interest here in Mexico about the problems you are attacking and, and what is happening around the world. So thank you all for for being here. And we continue with the seminar in 15 days. And uh, our next speaker is Esteban Vargas. I don't remember. I think so. Esteban Hernandez. Well, we will let you know. And please distribute and inform everybody that we have an interesting seminar if you like it. And we'll see you next in 15 days. Thank you, Silan, again. Thank you. Thank Josefa you. says hi. <laughs> mm. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Saludos. Bye -bye. Adios, Jorge. Saludos. Hasta luego. Que estén bien. Igualmente.